Well, greetings. Welcome to The Dividing Line. It is uh, Reformation Day. Um, well, for some of us, I, I've... It's always interesting every year uh, on Twitter. Uh, I do follow some Roman Catholics, and uh, it can get really weird on Reformation Day. There's there's one fellow, uh, Taylor Marshall, uh, has posted some really wild stuff. There's... You got to understand that uh, at the time of the Reformation and then thereafter, um, you know, I've mentioned before, uh, maybe I mentioned to you, I don't know, but uh, for example, uh, Sir Thomas More and uh, Martin Luther um, exhausted every possible Latin term for excrement in describing each other. Uh, in their voluminous writings against one another in Latin. Uh, there were no more Latin words that could be, that anyone ever thought of, that they used of each other. So, you know, we think things are bad now. <laughs> but let me tell you, uh, things could get really <clears throat> pretty crazy uh, even at the time of, uh, of the Reformation. So, at the time of the Reformation, you know, the woodcuts, the art that was used... Um, you know, by Protestants to describe Rome and the Pope. And you've seen, well, maybe you haven't, but most people who've done any reading at all in Reformation history, you've seen the woodcuts of, you know, the, the Pope made out to be a seven-headed serpent and, you know, uh, demons dancing around his head and stuff like that. And, and, and the Catholics did the same thing in reverse. <laughs> And so some of the, some of the stuff, <laughs> the, and, and there's still some Catholics that are pretty much on the same, uh, same, <laughs> same crusade they were on back then. Uh, I saw quotes attributed to Luther today and I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> and, and look, we, we attribute stuff to Luther that you can't find in any, of the many volumes of Luther's works, you can search, but you you won't find it. And so it it happens going going both directions. But that, on Sunday, I took a few minutes during the service, since it was Reformation Day service, to um, make a comment uh, similar to what I had posted on Twitter. And when Jeff took the pulpit, uh, he said, well, thank you, Dr. Downer. <laughs> and and uh, it, it's all because I, you, you know, I, I teach church history. And <sighs> so it, I have to tell you the truth. And I did see one meme so far today uh, on my feed uh, that was fairly accurate. It was a picture of Luther at the church door. There's no crowd around him. Uh, he has his 95 theses. And as he's nailing it to the door, there's other stuff on the door. There's other announcements and stuff on the door. And that was, that was pretty accurate. Most of the rest of them, you know, now with these AI generators you've got, which, by the way, I have never used anything AI in the sense of specifically AI. Like, AI the chat stuff, none of that stuff. I refuse to be one of the mice that help train these things because um, that's what you are. And there's these graphics generators that you can you know, make all these pictures and stuff with and... So there's been a bunch of those I've seen this year with Luther looking like Clark Kent, um, you know, Superman body, uh, which I can assure you he did not have. Um, and, you know, the big old, because we, we, didn't, we didn't talk much about Luther when I was a kid. Uh, we were independent fundamentalist Baptists and... If you talked about Luther, that sounded like the Lutherans, and we knew they weren't Christians, so uh, why, why would we even bother? And so we didn't really 
there, there was no Reformation Day stuff around our house at all. And, but the stories that I heard in my mind, I had pictured Luther walking up to the door of the church and that there was a service going on. And that this was part of the act of reformation or rebellion was that he's pounding on the church door during the service, which of course, as a kid, I'd be thinking of them, you know, singing blessed assurance or something. Uh, no idea what would be going on in a uh, church in the 1500s in Germany. And that, that, that was, you know, this big interruption. And of course I, as a kid, you haven't read the 95 Theses. Of course, as adults, the vast majority of people have not read the 95 Theses either. And so you assume it's some kind of truly Protestant document enunciating the five solas and, uh, and everything else along the way. Which, of course, none of that's true. Um, and so here's the Dr. Downer part. Um, here, here's what happened... Um, well, wow, we're up to uh, oh, six years ago. So, uh, man, my trip to, we, we did a, a tour prior to the 500th anniversary. So in 2017 in Germany, about a month before the celebration took place. And that seems like, it seems like yesterday, but it also seems like a lifetime ago, given everything that's happened since then. Uh, I'm so glad we got to do that. And, uh, of course, you know, uh, Nahum O'Brien was saying, okay, post your Reformation Day pictures, and it was he and his wife outside the Wittenberg door, uh, which is cool. But, of course, I can post a picture of me preaching from the pulpit, uh, actually preaching uh, to an entire congregation um, for over half an hour uh, there in the Castle Church. So here's, here's what really, really happens. So come with me for a moment. Um, and imagine what this was like. Um, Wittenberg's not a big town, even today. Uh, and it certainly was very small back then, very rural, uh, surrounded by fields and farms, which it still is today, really. I mean, obviously, less so than it was then, but very rural. The roads would have been dirty, dusty things. I'm not sure when they put cobblestones down, but I doubt it was there in 1517 because uh, the University of Wittenberg, where Luther was a new, newly minted professor, um, was brand new. And Frederick, the elector of Saxony, uh, you know, a lot of these guys would start universities and sort of to, to compete with one another, in essence. And so the way that you promoted your universities back then was to have competitions. Well, they didn't have football teams. And of course, over there, football would be what we call soccer in the United States. Uh, you didn't have sporting contests. Um, instead, you had debates. And these were get all your friends together, get the student body together, go on the road trip, which of course meant walking, generally, um, to some neighboring town or city. And the debate would last minimally all day, sometimes two days. And so you'd have a morning session, you'd have an afternoon session, and generally, by the time you got to the evening, that's when everybody drank German beer, and then you had other things happening, <laughs> fist fights and everything else. Um, but they were, they were all day affairs. And so all Luther was doing now, now Luther, Luther's reformation experience really, uh, began many years before this. Most people are aware of how little peace he derived from the sacramental system that while an Augustinian monk, he would, you know, sleep on a hard rock floor without a pillow uh, in the winter in Germany. Can you imagine what that's like? He, he pretty much ruined his digestive system, caused him major problems later in life, um, trying to 
As he himself said, if anyone would ever be saved by monkery, it would have been me. Um, but none of that gave him peace. And so um, his father confessor had uh, said to him, Staupitz had said to him, uh, well, he said a lot of things to him. He gave, he gave him actually a fair amount of very good advice, but he put him on the, the pathway to becoming a professor to learn more about God. Since you don't trust God, maybe you need to learn more about God. And he had lectured through the Psalms, and then he lectured through Romans. And somewhere, Romans, Galatians is where the light came on. Um, obviously, one of the most important parts in all this that we can't get into today, but the 1516 um, release of Erasmus's Greek New Testament was, well, Again, it wasn't a Greek New Testament. It was a diglot, and for Erasmus, the most important part was the Latin. But he was being exposed to the original languages and seeing the differences between the Latin Vulgate and, and the Greek. And somewhere in all of this, he was starting to come to understand the nature of grace, the nature of repentance, which is not penance, and so when Johann Tetzel came into the regions surrounding Saxony and that area of what we would modern day Germany, uh, back then wasn't a single state at all, um, he was scandalized by the preaching of Tetzel and this idea of selling the, the forgiveness of God. And everybody knew the money was just being raised to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome anyways. Uh, so it was, it was just another tax. So it, it, was be, it was leaving Germany and going to Italy to enrich the Italians rather than the Germans. So there was, there was at the time a rising nationalistic feeling in a lot of places in Europe that would become very important uh, because they're still coming out of the medieval period here. Anyway... He likewise had gone on pilgrimage to Rome in 1510 and had been scandalized by what he saw. He was scandalized by the Roman priests. He was scandalized by just the general immorality of the Romans. He was especially scandalized to see the Pope riding through the streets of Rome on a horse. He walked to Rome and back again, if you can imagine how long that took. Um, riding on a horse on, uh, uh, in armor, in battle armor, like a knight. Uh, there goes the Pope. Really? You know, that's, that's not what you'd envision the Pope to look like um, in their mindset. And so all these things were coming together. And so he had written, when you talk about 95 theses, these were 95 theses for debate. You know, you need to have a debate thesis. Um, we're working on a debate, and the the discussion over to exa uh, over exactly what the thesis is supposed to be has been interesting. And the thesis can make or break the debate. I've had some good debates with some bad theses, um, but all he was trying to do when he walked up to that door on October 31st, 1517, he walked up to it as a Roman Catholic monk. He walked up to it not viewing himself as a heretic because everything he said in the 95 Theses had been said by somebody else before him. This was There were a lot of people that were scandalized by this, the sale of indulgences. And most of them stayed within the Roman Catholic Church even when the Reformation began. So he was looking to start a debate. He was looking for some other university to take him up on this challenge um, and set up a debate, which would be good for the University of Wittenberg. That's, that's what it was all about. So there was no crowd. There may have been anybody around at all. If there was anybody, it was probably a farmer, 
walking by with his cow. Morning, Father Luther. Uh, Father Martin. Good morning. Blah blah blah. blah. Um, no one would have noticed it. That there was no church service going on. There was no rebellion taking place. Um, it was a simple act. Now, obviously, the, the the key thing to realize is God had been working for quite some time. I mean, I look back and I look at a, at, at the at the mind of a Wycliffe and go, that's where the Reformation should have started. But it couldn't. There was no printing press yet. And when you think of how important the printing press was to the Reformation, um, couldn't happen. Couldn't happen. Um, the Renaissance provided so much important uh, ability that the Reformation took advantage of. That had to take place. The universities had to be built um, because they became a hotbed of reform, certainly. And so there was just, all the pieces weren't in place when Wycliffe made his statements and his stand. Or Jan Hus, for that matter, when he's uh, killed the Council of Constance. Uh it just wasn't time yet. You could light the match, but there wasn't any, the fuel wasn't ready to go. Well, in October of 1517, the fuel was ready to go. And Luther lit the match and had no earthly idea that he had because a enterprising German printer comes along and he's looking at stuff that's posted on the door and he finds these 95 theses and he goes, ooh, these are spicy. Uh, why, why wouldn't, you know, if the Pope can, can empty out purgatory with indulgences, why wouldn't he do it just for love rather than for money? Ooh, uh. and so once they were translated from Latin into German, they probably sounded, well, anything translated into German <laughs> sounds a little bit rougher than it does in Latin and, um, and maybe even more so then. And so all of a sudden he finds himself famous because, you know, his name's getting circulated because these 95 theses have been printed. Now, there's dispute as to whether he knew about it or didn't know about it, uh, as far as you know, giving permission or not giving permission. But in any sense, um, that's what got his name around. But it's still going to be another year uh, until he runs, he does, he has the Leipzig di- disputation. He He's going to run into a man who's going to be his lifelong enemy, Johann Eck. And it is when he's debating Eck that stuff really starts to become clear. Because Eck starts quoting all these statements against Luther that sound like things that Luther has said, but they're actually quotations from Jan Hus. And all Luther knew at the moment, at the time, about Jan Hus is he was a heretic that had been burned a hundred years earlier. And he's saying the same thing. So during the break in the debate, he goes and looks up stuff by Jan Hus and goes, uh-oh, <laughs> Eck is right. I'm, I'm a Hussite. Um, and so he admitted in the debate, Hus said many true and evangelical things. Well, to most people, that was the end of the debate. He lost. He lost to Eck. And going back to Wittenberg, you know, he's he's talking with his closest friends, and he's like, I'm a Hussite. Uh, from what I've read, Huss was right. And of course, they burned Huss. And so that's when he has to start thinking through well, why should I consider, why should I be right about this and everybody else is wrong about it? And that's where you start getting the discussion of sola scriptura, because up up to then it was sola fide, it was justification by faith. But then he becomes challenged on the foundational issues, and that's where he starts coming to understand sola scriptura. Because he's like, but Hus was right, Hus is in line with what Paul says in Romans, and and how can you contradict that? And uh, yeah, but the Pope says, well, then the Pope's the Antichrist. It, it only took about a year and a half before before the Pope is the Antichrist uh, theme became prevalent in his writings. 
Uh, and again, that's where the printing press comes in because these writings explode all across Europe. And um, it's only a few years later that you know he's standing before Charles at the Diet of Worms and here stay Ishish Kandishtandras God help me here I stand I can do it no other God help me etc cetera, etc. Cetera. You know you've seen the movie or you maybe you'll watch the movie tonight or something or I don't know. Um, but the point is, sorry I, I hate to have to tell you this, um, but make sure that's off. Um, you know if you're planning on going out. As Martin Luther tonight, maybe you've uh, you've gotten the Martin Luther uh, wig thing to put on, so you got the tonsure cut, or maybe you've gone all the way and actually shaved the top of your head and only have the hair around the outside, and, um, and you, you've got your your hair robe and and everything else, you, and and you got your big old mallet that you're gonna carry along and um, your scroll with the ninety five theses. Sorry to ruin your day, uh, but I think it's important to know what actually happened and that no one in Wittenberg on October 31st or November 1st, that matter, had a clue that something important had started there. And it's, a, it's an arbitrary date that's just been picked up on by history and that's all there is to it. And so if you want to call me Dr. Downer for that, that's fine, but I haven't told you anything that people haven't known for a long, 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 long time uh, in regards to that. It is interesting to note that this Reformation Day comes uh, at a time period where most people don't, don't realize this. There are people within the Roman Catholic Church that do know what's going on. But there are major, major developments in Roman Catholicism right now. It's, it's interesting. Most of the time when big things happen in history, the people alive at the time don't really have any idea that really, really big, important stuff is happening uh, because it just doesn't seem all that important at the time until things develop afterwards. Well, there has been a a, it's sort of the beginning of a synod process in Rome. It's not how they've done it before, really. This was a synod on synodality. And we've talked about it a little bit. We talked that there was a synod beginning in Rome, and a lot of people were wondering, with someone like Francis and especially with all of the people he has put in place, what, what might this lead to? Well, fascinating. There's a lot of stuff out there if you start following the right people on Twitter. Um, but this is from the um, uh, New Catholic Register. National Catholic Register, sorry. National Catholic Register. Cardinal Mueller says synod on synod synodality is being used by some to prepare the church to accept false teaching. So who's Cardinal Mueller? He is the prefect emeritus of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. What was the congregation for the doctrine of the faith? Because I think they changed the name recently. Uh, the congregation of the doctrine of the faith was the modern continuation of the Inquisition. Uh, Ratzinger had been the head of that as well, uh, who became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. So, this guy was the guy who headed up the Inquisition. <laughs> okay. And Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, the former prefect for the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, says the Synod on Synodality is not an Episcopal Assembly but more like an Anglican synodal meeting and is being used by some participants as a means to prepare the Catholic Church to accept ideologies that run contrary to Scripture and tradition. Both capitalized, by the way. In an extensive October 24th interview with the Register, Cardinal Mueller also warned that some in the Assembly are abusing the Holy Spirit in order to introduce new doctrines such as an acceptance of homosexuality, 
women priests, and a change in church governance. As one of 52 delegates personally chosen by Pope Francis to attend the October 4th to 29th meeting, the first of two assemblies which will conclude in 2024, the German Cardinal participated in all of this month's session before departing early on October 25th to ordain new priests in Poland. Cardinal Mueller said the synodal meeting was very controlled and quite manipulated, with most of the interventions coming only from a few keynote speakers who spoke to them, listen to this, spoke to them as if they knew no theology. He said that he himself was given only three minutes to speak to the whole assembly. The interviewer said, Your Eminence, what has been your overall assessment of the Synod on Synodality? Uh, He says he was invited. Um, He said its organization, its input did not come from above. In the form of synods, all the bishops in the plenary could speak about what they wanted. Now everything is led, it's pre-organized, it's difficult to speak in the plenary because it's only a short time is given. According to the rules, you can only speak once and only for three minutes. Uh, Would you have liked to speak for more? Yeah. Um, He says, um, for the next part of the Synod, it will be important to reorganize it, to give more freedom, more opportunity for the bishops to present their ideas. It must become more like a Synod of bishops for the bishops to reclaim their role as advisors and witnesses of the revealed truth. Uh, he's asked, there was a great emphasis on the Holy Spirit, the Synod. What did you make of that? Um, he says, uh, some speakers said we must be open to the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm sitting here going, man, it, it's the same thing's happening in Rome. Because I think back a number of years to that debate that Bob Gagnon had with Dr. Kirk here in Phoenix area, in Scottsdale. And Kirk's whole thing was being open to the Holy Spirit, uh, being open to leading the Holy Spirit in coming to see our LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters as equals in the body, so on and so forth. He says, um, these were the voices of the Holy Spirit as if we were beginners in the study of theology. It was like seminary or university, but a synod is not a school for beginners. And yet they were speaking to us as if the bishops don't know much theology. Many bishops there understood theology and they couldn't speak of their knowledge. Um, One of the assigned speakers, he says, who is influenced by this LGBT ideology, spoke of a relative who was bisexual who committed suicide. And the conclusion was the church must be open not to these persons, but to the ideology. The ideology is to blame for this, but we cannot resolve theological questions and problems through emotion. Sound familiar? It's the exact same game plan. This is only speaking emotionally about the Holy Spirit, and we were told we mustn't make controversies. That speaking strongly against anything isn't possible, or one is stigmatized as an enemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, that... Y'all remember the programs last week? (laughs) Uh, It's happening in Rome as well. Um, So, uh, some, some speakers, right? Listen to this. Some speakers also speak of openness and define what tradition is, saying that it is not static, it is dynamic. Huh. Where have we heard that one before? Well, the Constitution isn't static. It's such a living document. It's a dynamic. (laughs) That's how you go. So we're not going to worry about what it says. But in the end, all of these so-called synodal reflections are aimed at preparing us to accept homosexuality. Only this, what wasn't spoken about was Jesus Christ or divine revelation, the grace of human persons created according to the image and likeness of God, And of God is the goal of our human existence. All is being turned around so that now we must be open to homosexuality and the ordination of women. If you analyze it, all is about converting us to these two themes. Now that's the head of the Inquisition giving you his interpretation of what just happened at the Synod where everybody that was chosen to be there was chosen by Pope Francis. Okay? Um, he said there, he said, um, he was asked, 
And also governance, do you think it's also an attempt to overturn the hierarchical governance of the church? He says, yes. Some have this image of an inverted pyramid of government, governance, but the center of this pyramid is the personal will of the Pope and of his advisors and collaborators. This can be an image for making clear to children, but a pyramid or polyhedron is not a biblical image of the church. These are images coming out of mathematical geometry. Instead, they should be looking towards biblical images of the church in Lumen Gentium. Whoops, wrong place. Boy, if you looked in the Bible, it would be really different. The shepherd and the flock and all these images of a vineyard and so so forth. Some speakers had a sociological idea of the church, a naturalistic understanding of the church, but they did not have the theological understanding. They're always speaking of the Spirit, but the Spirit is not a fluid. The Spirit in the Church is the third person of the Trinity. He is a person, and we never can speak of the Holy Spirit without the Son and the Father. Always and at all times we speak of the Spirit of the Father and of the Son. Hardly ever mentioned was Jesus Christ. Only in a pedagogical way, in ways that transform the parables and their meaning. Jesus didn't condemn the woman in adultery, for instance. Intervention spoke of our relation to Jesus, but not as Jesus as the Word of God given to us once and forevermore. Well, absolutely the same thing going on on both sides of the Tiber uh, at, at that point. So what was really interesting, and I don't have it up right now, I, I, I thought I saved the, um, uh, saved the screenshot, but I, I couldn't find it. One, uh, there was a, there was like a, a news conference type thing. And what was the exact question? There was some controversy over what somebody said and somebody tried to contradict what somebody else said, blah, 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 blah. Make a long story short, what it was about was one of the primary authorities basically saying, uh, pointing to the change, and it is a change, in the doctrine of capital punishment, which we've talked about, we've read you the 1592 Council of Trent Catechism that identifies the act of capital punishment as part of the state as a gift from God to the state to maintain order. And so the you could you could fundamentally say that there was you know up until only let's just say a hundred years ago a very consistent understanding in regards to capital punishment in the state. And now it's been reversed. So sixteen, seventeen hundred years worth of quote unquote tradition. So what? Pope Francis can change that because he's the Pope. And I, 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 I just remind you of how many times I've, I've mentioned, because I, because I, I remember sitting right here, and I don't think it was this table. I think it was a different table back then. Walls weren't painted yet. This is a while ago. But I remember being in this room talking about. Uh, I had put together a something for the blog back then. We were blogging before they they had a word for blogging. And I had put together a contrast between something that John Paul II had said and something that a previous pope had said. And it was Robert Genis who at that time had, had contacted me, or we had some exchange somehow electronically, who had basically said, who are you to interpret what was meant by the church in the past. Only the church gets to interpret what the church said in the past. And so the modern church gets to interpret the ancient church. And so if the ancient church said X, if the modern church says not X, you just have to go, I guess they meant not X back then, even if it's painfully obvious that that's simply not true. And so this is the problem with the Roman Catholic system of ecclesiology. They had the opportunity, once the Council of Constance healed what's called the Babylonian captivity, the the schism of the church, where you had as many as three popes. There was a brief window there where they could have opted for a system of government where councils, a conciliar form, 
of government with maybe as a, a pope as an important leader, but not someone that can overrule a council. But the popes closed that down real quick. And uh, anyone who tried to promote that idea found themselves tied to a stake and providing light for everybody. And so Rome stuck with this. Once you had Vatican I, uh, there's no going back. There's no redefining this stuff. You, you try to redefine this stuff, and you're just basically saying, hey, we're making it up as we're going along. Um, there is no reason to believe this is a 2,000-year-old uh, church or any of the rest of this stuff. We're just sort of, you know, with the winds of society or whatever, we're just going to do what we're going to do. So that's the problem. And one of this, one of, one of these high up archbishops or something like that, what they said was they pointed to that change in the Catholic catechism on the issue of uh, capital punishment in answer to a question on the issue of homosexuality. So how does the Roman Catholic deal with this? Now, the rock-ribbed Super conservative Roman Catholic goes, we've had bad popes before. But the problem is Vatican I says the Pope will not lead the church astray on matters of faith and morals. So when the Pope's on an airplane early on in his, in his pontificate, and so he's asked a question about homosexuality, and he says, who am I to judge? We all raise an eyebrow and go, uh, in your system, you are the guy to judge. <laughs> what, what do you mean, who are you to judge? But that's on an airplane. Um, when, you, when you change this, okay, this is, this is what you're supposed to believe. This is what you're telling the world you believe. And when you specifically instruct that this is to be reversed on a belief that you, you can go back to 1592, there it is, in print, unquestionable, this contradicts that. And it's supposed to be the one infallible church. So, what's to keep Francis, or more likely, Francis's successor, from doing the same thing. I mean, Fra Francis just gave pastoral permission for blessings of same-sex unions as long as you don't make it look like a wedding. Not, as long as you don't make it look like a, a marriage. Y'all remember the United Methodists doing that only a few years ago? Remember? That's how it happened in every denomination. Oh, well, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not calling it a wedding. We're not, we're not really calling it marriage. No. And how fast did that change into, well, of course it's a marriage. Of course it's a wedding. Of course that's actually a woman. Blah, 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 blah. It, it didn't take any time at all. It would take longer in Roman Catholicism because it just moves so slow. But it still happened. And it's happening in Rome whether you want to accept it or not. And what does that mean? What, the, what What's that communicating? When we first started dealing with Roman Catholicism in the late 1980s, and I started dialoguing with people like um, Scott Windsor, there's a, a name that uh, I just saw Rich go, whoa, I hadn't heard that name in a while, huh? Long, long time. Um, people like that, uh, leading to the writing of The Fatal Flaw, Answers to Catholic Claims, and then the fateful day when the phone call came from Jerry Matitix at Catholic Answers, and let's do a debate, and that was debate number one. <laughs> uh, done a lot of them since then. Um, when we first started dealing with that, all that stuff, and, you know, I went to Catholic Answers headquarters, and I remember walking into the offices and, um, you know, there was uh, you know, Patrick Madrid's desk and Jerry Matitix's desk and 
I think Mark Brumley was there. Maybe. Somebody else was there. Anyway, Carl Keating. The, the primary argumentation was we have a pope and we don't have the anarchy that you all have because we have someone to go to that can give us an infallible interpretation of Scripture. And John Paul II was definitely a stabilizing pontificate. Vatican II had been a little bit of a revolution for a lot of people. And so he was Pope for a long time. So you at least had some level of consistency, even though in reality, you know, one year he'd throw something conservative to the conservatives, the next year something liberal to the liberals, trying to keep everybody happy. But you don't get the same thing today. You do not get the same kind of discussion today that you did back then about the Pope. These rock-ribbed Concern, you know, Catholic apologists won't be Catholic apologists for long if they're not very conservative. Progressives, liberals, they have nothing to defend. So why why bother? They don't they don't involve themselves in apologetics. So the apologists tend to be very conservative. And these people are pulling their hair out. They have been for 10 years with Pope Francis. Um, but it's getting worse and worse and worse. And they really don't know what to do about it. It's a, it's, it's a difficult time to be a Roman Catholic apologist because it's painfully obvious where this man's going. And what it does is it sheds tremendous light on the authority claims of the Roman Catholic Church. And so if you can have the current Pope reverse centuries of Roman Catholic teaching, then all the claims that Roman Catholic apologists have been making about, well, we don't have your problem, we've got the Pope, and he will infallibly teach us you know, what, what we're to believe. And, and, and it's like, no, actually he won't. <laughs> I mean, aside from the fact that the entire doctrine of papal infallibility is a paper tiger, it has no meaning. Um, any pope can say anything. Pope Francis could say something, and what what will happen is the same thing you're seeing now. Well, he can't he can't contradict tradition. Well, he's the definer of tradition. What do you mean he can't contradict tradition? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to even pretend you can interpret tradition? Um, so you're, you're, you're stuck in a vicious circle and, you know, you could argue that, well, you know, if they start having female priests, you could argue, well, that was never a dogma. It was a discipline. How many hundreds of years have to pass before that discipline is clearly and obviously a dogma? Um, but you look at the issue of homosexuality, you change on that. You start blessing same-sex marriages and then start allowing them and start, aside from the fact that Rome has a serious homosexuality problem to begin with in the priesthood, um, and everybody admits that. I mean, it's the only the only argument is extent, not the reality thereof. Leave that off to the side. You have there, there is no way that any rational person can sit there and say, "Yes, um, the papacy has always taught the one gospel of Jesus Christ, except on these issues." <laughs> Because no one's going to be able to sit there and say, yeah, we're, we're teaching the same thing now that we were teaching then. And that's really what I've been pushing at for years and years and years. When I say, and I get no responses, I mean, you, you want to shut down, <laughs> you want to shut down a conversation. I can't tell you how many times this works like a charm on Twitter. 
somebody will be raging on about 2,000-year-old church and all the rest of this stuff. And I just go, so um, name me the bishop at the Council of Nicaea who believed his dogma, everything you have to believe is dogma today. I mean, it should be pretty easy. I mean, Nicaea, the first ecumenical council, so important. You know, all Christians look to it as, as a, I mean, it was certainly a turning point uh, in so many different ways. Uh, show me a bishop who is the Council of Nicaea who dogmatically believes everything you have to believe as a Roman Catholic today. And there were none, and they all know it. They all know it. So many of the things that have been defined as dogma since Nicaea developed long after Nicaea. Nobody there dreamed of the bodily assumption of Mary, but you have to believe the bodily assumption of Mary as dogma day, de fide. Now, does Francis believe in the bodily assumption of Mary, de fide? In the way a progressivist might put it. I mean, remember, <laughs> I'll never <laughs> I'll never forget. I'm going to be saying that a lot uh, as I get older. And, you know, we this chair is worn out. We need to get a new one. Rich hasn't got me a new chair yet. That's how I'm going to get a new chair. So I'm just going to mention it on every program until someday I'm going to walk in and there's going to be a new chair. But fairly soon, it's going to be a rocking chair instead of instead of a office chair. And Rich will have one too in the other room, and we'll just sit here and, you know, there'll be very long dividing lines, but very slow moving. <laughs> but I, I'll never forget. Well, now I'm not, now, now I've forgotten what the point was I was going to make. See? See how that works? What was, which, which, it was, it was, an, it was a cool illustration too. But, you know, when you chase the rabbit, you can chase the rabbit around one bend. But once you hit the second bend, you're lost. You'll, you'll never get back to where you were going. <laughs> I might think of it later on. Uh, but anyway, uh, these this synod could be one of the most important steps toward this redefinition in regards to homosexuality. And once you redefine homosexuality, marriage... And everything goes right along with it. And man, that leaves a very small number of us holding firm um, at all on, on that particular topic. And this morning I was listening, um, sort of switching topics a little bit here. Uh, I was listening to um, Dr. Moeller read some of the amazing comments that were made by leftists regarding the new Speaker of the House. Now, well, eventually, maybe I'll have Jeff on to talk about it, or a friend of mine from Louisiana, but eventually we need to talk about what happened in Louisiana in the defeat of the abolition bill there, where we had the votes. We It would have passed. And it was killed by one particular individual and it's the new speaker of the house um which surprises a lot of people because you know hey you want to know my you know he said you want to, want to know my worldview pick up a bible and read it that sounds great i'm glad someone's willing to say that but you need to realize how deeply entrenched the pro-life industry way of thought is and even when we had the votes to abolish human abortion in um, in Louisiana on a gospel basis, that's what the, that's what the issue is. I don't have time to go into this right now, but the issue was from the pro life perspective, what you can never ever do is make abortion a gospel issue. What I mean by that is the issue the the, the real central topic is, is there, is the mother guilty of the murder of her unborn child? And you've seen the horrific videos and stuff, people coming, going out, celebrating their abortions, or they're about to get abortion, and they're talking about killing the little baby, and oh, this is going to be so great, you know, and, and hashtag, they're not victims. 
But that is so built into the DNA of the pro-life movement that if you in any way raise the idea of punishment for abortion and hence make it something that can be repented of and you receive forgiveness for, there's the issue. Then they're like, nope, can't do it. Never, ever do it. Anyway, Moeller was um, talking about the just the language that people are using on the left of extremism and nutcase. And so once, see, right now, officially, Rome still says uh, homosexuality is, is a uh, disordered desire um, and holds to certain basic fundamental positions. If that changes, I'm going to tell you something. Those few of us that hold firm, um, I can see the full force of the legal system coming down upon us. Can't right now because what, what religious group has the primary power in, say, on the Supreme Court? or in the Senate of the United States, Roman Catholicism. But if they no longer have the official position of Rome, what's, what's left? What happened to Randall Terry? Well, I, I remember they went after him, yeah. So they, they got him, and they got him under Rico. Yeah. And what, he did 10 years, if I recall. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I'm actually amazed that it hasn't happened a lot more than that. Yeah. Well, the uh, the floodgates may well open in that in that situation. No two ways about it. But keep your eyes on what's going on. Things are happening right now in front of us. And yeah, you know, the media doesn't cover much of it. I, I get it. Um, they're they're not overly concerned about these things, but. Keep an eye on it uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, developments are going to happen. All right. So it's going to be a little longer program today. That's why I wasn't rushing through that because I think it's important to talk about it. But most of you signed in to watch today. Uh, there are people that were posting uh, images, memes of uh, getting your popcorn ready and all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, that's because uh, this morning, well, it, it, it popped up on mine. I suppose I should, uh, I, can, I can real quick check the, uh, check the date here just to double check things. Uh, yep, I posted October 31st, 2023. So this morning, uh, Jared Longshore published an article called, Are Your Children Members of the New Covenant? And um, so, uh, and then there's a fellow, and the only reason that I mentioned this, I wasn't going to mention it, but literally as I looked over at my screen, um, it refreshed, and Brandon Lansdowne, uh, and now it refreshed again. <laughs> I hate when it, I, I have, you know, I've stopped using TweetDeck. I, I happen to have it up right now, but I've stopped using TweetDeck because what it started doing is I'll be sitting there and I'll be reading a tweet and then poof, it's gone. And it's like, well, well wait, it, it, it was there just a second ago. Where, where, where'd it go? And, it, and you, you can scroll and scroll and scroll and never find it again. So Brandon Lansdowne, pastor of, I think, Coram Deo Reformed Church, I think is what I was seeing. Ah, uh, there it is. Um, I moved from Credo to Pedo. Uh, he, just, he just announced that he, he's left uh, being a Reformed Baptist and now he's a Presbyterian. Which, by the way, is not just a view on baptism, I guess. I've always found it interesting that people that make that move never talk about ecclesiology. They never talk about how they go from um, 
a Baptist ecclesiology to a Presbyterian ecclesiology. And I'm like, so did you read the Five Views of Church Governance book that came out many years ago? I did the plurality of elders view. And Robert Raymond, God bless his soul, uh, did the Presbyterian view. And to be honest with you, we were the only two that took it seriously. I mean, one of the other guys literally started off his essay by saying, you know, you look at the New Testament, the plurality of elders seems to be what they were talking about, but I've been assigned the single pastor role, so here's, here we go. And it was, a, it was sort of a written debate between me and Robert Raymond on ecclesiology. And it's, it's just really interesting to me how people can change their views on this thing over here, and they'll just go ahead and go, okay, I'll go with that too. But it was clearly not a part. Uh, it was sort of like, well, I like this so much, I'll just go ahead over here. And, and it's like, hmm, that, that, that's always interesting to me, how that, how that can work. Um, you can make a change in one place, and let's just go ahead and we'll just go along with the others along the way. But anyways, uh, fellow announced that as so many, this is, this is my observation after decades doing this, um, you get people and they, they're in an evangelical church, they've imbibed a basic Baptist understanding, you know, maybe they've heard a few sermons about, hey, the New Testament pattern is always... Uh, repent, believe, be baptized. Sounds great. There's no infant baptism in the New Testament. So cool, fine. And they've they've never, the vast majority of them do not have a sound covenantal understanding of what baptism means. They don't know about the you know signs of a covenant. What's a sign of a covenant? Why would, why would you give signs of a covenant to someone who's not in the covenant? Well, how do you get into the covenant? What's the nature? And then, of course, that issue aside, you go over to the other side, and there is no end to the complexity of discussions of covenant theology amongst Reformed people. I mean, there are there are some Reformed folks. Man, that is all they ever talk about. Um, and it, you can start drawing lines, and it can look just as confusing as any dispensational eschatology chart ever. <laughs> and you know, we see those we see those books with all the, you know. Uh, Fold out. Was it Larkin? Was that was that the name of the Larkin? You should know. Um, uh, you know, you get this fold out. This is this big? This timeline of history and the different dispensations and all the rest of this kind of stuff. Some folks in the covenant theology get to the same point. It gets just that complex. Uh, and sometimes what's lost in all of that is biblical definitions and that can happen even amongst reformed folks anyway what happens is you, they they grab hold of reformed theology in the sense of reformed soteriology five points six points seven points however many you want to make it and they get all excited about it and you see the sovereignty of god and you start seeing his his purposes through time and it becomes a pendulum and you you swing out of that evangelicalism and then you start reading more and more, and you go, wow, a lot of these folks were Presbyterians, and they believed in paedo baptism And for a lot of folks, that's enough right there to overcome any, whatever positive Baptist theology they had. Um, and then you get certain people that you really, really like a lot, and boy, if they took that position, then you read their stuff and go, wow, there it is, I, I believe. And the pendulum swings all the way, and the amount of effort that had been put into making sure of this stuff over here isn't nearly as much once you get once you got the once you got that momentum going, you know, you got that swing going. And I've seen it over and over again. I, I can I could point to I could point you to two or three Baptist guys right now that I can pretty much guarantee you, within three years they will not be Baptists. I, I could I could name them for you right now. I'm not going to. 
but I could. Um, you can just see it. Because the reason I remain a Baptist, having done multiple debates in the subject, every one of which I was challenged to do. I just keep reminding people of that. That's not one that we ran around looking for somebody. I want to debate somebody on paedo baptism. No. Um, every debate that I've done on that subject was because I was challenged to do that debate. I was the one that was invited to that debate. Okay. So, um, every I've, 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 I've listened to the arguments, and I've recognized that there are a wide variety of arguments that are not consistent with one another. Um, I firmly believe the Westminster Confession of Faith is inconsistent with itself. It's contradictory to itself. When, when you say baptism is a positive, it's, it's a positive command of Jesus Christ, and then you baptize infants, you're having to stretch that way out there. And look, hey, don't get upset with me. The federal vision stuff of 2001, 2002 really shone a light on the fractures that exist amongst people who say, I'm co being consistent with the Westminster Confession of Faith. You've got people on both sides who are contradicting each other and both pointing to the Westminster Confession of Faith as being the deciding factor. Uh, so that's your own history. You, you've just got to own up to that reality. So anyway, uh, I've, I've heard all the arguments and, and I know where my friends over there go and my friends over there go and how they do this with the New Covenant they do that with the New Covenant. A number of years ago, I think it was probably getting close to 15 years ago, I wrote some uh, articles for a Reformed Baptist publication. They ended up in a book. And they're on the subject of the New Covenant in the book of Hebrews and specifically the citation of Jeremiah 31 in Hebrews chapter 8. And this, for me, has always been the primary issue. What is the nature of the New Covenant? And this has got me in, into trouble all over the place, but when it comes to baptism, um... I'm very much in the same camp that I am in the Trinity. Um, I believe in the Trinity because the Bible forces me to. And I'm really uncomfortable going beyond divine revelation, especially in the Trinity, because you can't know the truth of the Trinity outside of God revealing it in special revelation. It's not something you can't sit there and Look at a beautiful tree as it turns colors in the fall and go, ah, oh, there's the Trinity. It doesn't work. It is special revelation, and therefore, we should believe what the apostles taught on the subject. And Calvin was right. When God makes an end of speaking, so should we. But we haven't, and that's what causes a lot of the problems. Same thing with baptism. Um, what I believe about baptism, I believe because of exegesis because I, I try to be consistent and I try to use the same exegetical hermeneutical principles in baptism that I do in soteriology, ecclesiology, whatever, it, whatever it might be. So, uh, the article, and of course, Jared Longshore went paid about what, about two years ago now, something like that. He had been with, uh, Founders, of course. Um, and so you can, I'll, I'll, I'll link to the article. Um, he quotes from Jeremiah 31. Uh, he says that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people say, many, many claim that the new covenant is so unlike the Abrahamic covenant that the natural children are no longer included as members. Well, there is a, there's a, there's a lot there. But we are talking about a covenant described in Hebrews 7, 8, 9 as a better covenant. Okay, so built upon what? Better promises. 
that that's not my language. That's the right that's the language of scripture. And so any covenantal theologian knows that we all have to deal with issues of continuity and discontinuity. And when we want to emphasize one over the other to give us an advantage over the other side, we will. But everybody has to deal with continuity and discontinuity. And so let me let me just look at this here. Um, he says the chief text of scripture supply to support this claim is Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Well, yes and no. Um, there are a number of references to covenants in Jeremiah, but only one is cited in the New Testament with apostolic authority, and that's in Hebrews 8. That's the key. So I think before reading the, looking at the article, because I want to respond to a couple of points, I think it's important to, to look at Hebrews 8. So um, grab that Bible, my friend. Grab that Bible. Oh, you want me to you want to do that, huh? I see you over there. Nope, oh, going the wrong way. There we go. Get that a little bit bigger. Well, like Greek is way way too big now, so that's a little bit better. I'll go ahead and it's always nice to have a Jeffrey Rice rebind nearby. Gives you a lot more there's authority, you know, when you got you got your PTL. When you have you know, uh, Keith Fosky, who, by the way, I've known forever. I've known Keith forever. He'll tell you that. Um, but he just put out, I think he just put out one. Did you see his new video called um, uh, Denominational? Oh, what was that game show? Family Feud? Denominational Feud or something like that? Did you see the Reformed Baptist guy? First time I've ever seen him use someone other than himself. And he has this guy... And he's strapped, man. He's got a he's got a nine mil over here and a forty five over here, and and he's just he just taps the end of one of the guns. <laughs> Reformed Baptist. <laughs> the Presbyterians won big time, uh, but uh, it was it was hilarious. It really really was. And if we all could just have our conversations as civilly as uh, Keith Foskey does with himself, but the uh, the the superior. Uh, the Presbyterian has always got a, a, a stogie and a bow tie and a s sweater vest on and superior theology. You know, we've got the superior theology. I have the superior Bible. <laughs> so, so there, that's how we're going to go there. All right. Here's, I, I don't have forever. So some of you think, I think that I do. So let's. Try to be concise, but I, I need to hit the important point. Here's the issue. The text in Hebrews has to have has to be approached in context. And here's what Hebrews is about. I remember, I forget when it was, but it was many, many years ago. I was flying home from someplace, and I said, you know, I'm going to set my presuppositions aside, and I'm just going to read Hebrews on the way home. I just want to I just want to listen to what I want to read all of it. What's what what is it what's it trying to say? And it became very very clear to me that what Hebrews is is an extended apologetic argument addressed to Jewish believers in the early decades of the Christian movement before the temple was was destroyed. So it's pre-70, there's no question about that. It talks about the ongoing sacrifices, so it's, it's just obvious. This is probably 50s, 60s, uh, early 60s at the latest, I would, I would say. And the whole argument is this. There's nothing to go back to. There's nothing to go back to. There's so much pressure being put upon them. You've joined a cult. This is got, not going not gonna to ever amount to anything. Uh, come back, and of course, to come back meant that you had to offer sacrifice, which was, in essence, to say that Jesus guy followed for a while. He wasn't what he claimed to be. He 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 died a criminal's death, and his blood was not a sacrifice for sins. And so it was a 
is to trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God. That's what you're supposed to do. And the whole argument of Hebrews is there's nothing to go back to. Um, and I'll prove that by the supremacy of who Jesus is. So, I mean, Hebrews chapter 1, he's Yahweh. He's, he's, uh, he, he's the one who's create, create, he's abstain, sustaining the, the creation. And he, the author will literally take a text about the unchangeable Yahweh and apply it to Jesus. To the Son, specifically, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. And then, as you follow it along and you can outline it, the supremacy of Jesus in this, and the supremacy of Jesus in that, and the supremacy in this way and that way. And then you get into, and this is why a lot of people lose the, the story, you get into the demonstration of the Melchizedek priesthood and the supremacy of Christ's priesthood versus the old priesthood. Um, all of things, all these things would have been vitally important in that day and time, um, because it was all part of the come back, come back, come back. And the argument is there's nothing to come back to. So in chapter seven, so let's get the context here in chapter six, you know, you have the warning about being in the congregation and then abandoning that and along with the promise that you have the sure anchor that goes into the holy place. Um, it's beautiful. It's sad that Hebrews 6 is primarily known about the warning passage and not about the, the anchor of our faith uh, passage at, at the end of the chapter. But then in chapter 7, you start getting into the issue of this better covenant, better mediator, Melchizedek, um, and what the Melchizedek priest can do. So, Hebrews 7.20, Inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests on oath, but he with an oath, the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So, again, um, very, very important. The 110th Psalm. I mean, just Psalm 2, Psalm 110, central to Christology in the writers' minds of the New Testament. They just they're quoting it from it all the time. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. A Critanos diathekes, better covenant. Whatever this covenant is, it's better than the old. It's better than what it is replacing. There is a discontinuity in the covenant. Now, my Presbyterian brothers get around that by saying, yeah, we're not talking about the Abrahamic, we're talking about the Mosaic. It's only the Mosaic, it's not the Abrahamic. And again, be careful. Be careful with your polemics today, that you don't take a position that would have weakened or muted Paul's argument then. Because I think this is Paul. I don't think Paul wrote it. Luke wrote it. It's Luke's vocabulary. It's Luke's syntax. It's difficult Greek. It's classical Greek. But I think he's writing what Paul preached in another language. Hebrew, Aramaic, whatever it might be. Anyway, don't don't let your modern context weaken the apologetic argument of the apostolic context. I think that's a danger that some people don't even give a second thought to. Um, if you're if you're saying, well, it's not that that's not the covenant we're talking about. We're talking about the Abrahamic covenant. We're not talking about the Mosaic covenant. Um, could that have been used? in response to the apologetic being given in Hebrews by the people saying, come back. I don't hear people talking about that. They, they should, but I don't. Um, so it goes on to say, 723, the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing, but Jesus, on the other hand, because he abides or remains forever, 
holds his priesthood operabaton permanently without successor. There are no successors to Jesus' priesthood, and that includes the young guys on the bikes riding through your neighborhood right now who think they are, but they're not. Therefore, because he holds his priesthood permanently, therefore he is able also to save forever, pantales, forever or completely, those who draw near to God through him. Why? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now we've spent much time on this in the past. Um, you know, I was, uh, listening to, and we're going to do a Radio Free Geneva, Lord willing, I'm going to go ahead and say it now, but things could come up, but my plan right now on Thursday is to do a Radio Free Geneva, um, in response to the fellow I, I did the response to last time I was on the road on John 6, who was a Calvinist for 10 years and now he's not. And one of the things he said, and he got around to doing something on John 6, which he thought was a response to what I said, but it really isn't, sadly. Um, one of the things he said was that the Calvinists do not have a single argument for limited atonement. And I'm like, so I wrote to him on Twitter and I said, you ever read Death of Death and the Death of Christ by John Owen? I have a copy, but I've, you know, I, I haven't read much of it. Okay, those 10 years wasn't long enough. <laughs> and here's one right here. Um, why is Christ able to save completely those who draw near to God through him? Because he always lives to make intercession for them. The intercessory work of Christ is able to save completely. So who does he intercede for? Does he intercede for all people? Does he intercede for the Amorite high priest? Is he interceding for the Buddhist monk in Tibet right now? Um, no, it's those who draw near to God through him. Through him. His people. His intercession is specifically for them, as was the intercession of the high priest under the Old Covenant. And that's the parallel that's being made. The point is, he has complete power to save utterly. For it's fitting for us to have such high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all. Once for all. And again, just real quickly, Ephapox, Hapox, Ephapox is just simply the strengthened version of Hapox. Once for all does not mean one time for all people. It's a temporal term. It means once for all time, period. It's a singular act. So he made this offer once for all when he offered up himself. So the, the offering of Christ is a singularity in time which is what makes the Roman Catholic representation of it in an unbloody manner so that it perfects no one such a blasphemy against the teaching of Scripture. It is. It's, it, it undoes the finishedness, and that's why there's no peace. That's why, there's, that's why you can't know. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever. I'm going through this very quickly. If you want great expansion of all of this, I preached 85 sermons through Hebrews a number of years ago. They're still available online on Sermon Audio. Now, the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the high heavens. So, again, the contrast here, the high priest under the old covenant, there is no place to sit on the day of atonement. You go into the holy place, there's no place to sit. Because he wasn't meant to stay there. Because he did he did not come into there carrying a sacrifice sufficient to provide a place to sit. The blood of goats and calves cannot provide forgiveness of sins. 
But Christ, sacrificing himself, enters into the holy place, and he is seated at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. The finishedness of that work. A minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to law. He was not of the tribe of Levi. Who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. By the way, just briefly, do you see, do you see the apologetic element of this? Come back to the temple. Look at that beautiful temple. There's, there's no building on it like earth. Come back, offer sacrifice. And what is the, uh, the argument here? It's a shadow. It's a shadow. In fact, it was the tabernacle that was the shadow of the heavenly things. The temple is but a picture of what the tabernacle was. Who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. Now, whatever you do, you have to recognize that the new covenant is a better covenant. Now, it sometimes scares me. It almost sounds to me sometimes like my Presbyterian friends are saying, yes, it's better than Mosaic, but not the Abrahamic. And it's like, again, and wouldn't that have been the answer that would have been given by the Jews to Paul's argument? You, you, can't, you can't undo the Pauline argument. There is, he, is a, he, is, he is not the mediator of the Abrahamic covenant. He is the mediator of the new covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Enacted. Now, not way back then. The Abrahamic covenant, beautiful, all across the world, blessing to all the people, but it's the Abrahamic, and there's much more to come. There, there's a necessity for much more to come that comes in this new, better covenant, and he is the mediator of it. Always keep in mind, because Jared's going to say this in his article. He's going to talk about a covenant made in the blood of Jesus. Well, the new covenant, he's the mediator of that covenant. And so the question will always be, what does he mediate to the members of that covenant? Because whatever it is, it's been enacted on better promises than what existed before. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, and so here you get this long quotation from Jeremiah 31. It is in the context of the mediator can save the uttermost, better covenant, better promises, a fault existing in the first covenant. and But then he says, for finding fault with them, he says. And then you have the quotation. So let's listen to how the quotation is made. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, says Yahweh, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Which, by the way, I shouldn't, I should mention this in passing. Um, it's not his position now. But if you look at the original printing of the book, of the commentary on Hebrews by John MacArthur in the New Testament commentary series, MacArthur was a strong dispensationalist at the time, and he took the position in that original that Hebrews 8 is not about, is only with Israel. It's not with us as believers. Um, because it says the house of Israel and the house of Judah. If this is with believers, then obviously, what does that mean? That we're the true circumcision. And that's a big argument right now. Uh, you find out how people's eschatology and stuff will impact all of their theology. And uh, we're seeing that right now. 
when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. So you see, oh, that's, that's just a mosaic. That's, that's not the Abrahamic. Okay, that's true. But the Abrahamic leads into all the other covenants. There are, yes, there's, there are continuities. And yes, we've been justified the same way all along. I, I agree a thousand percent. But there are also discontinuities, major discontinuities. And we're about to see them. How is it not like that? Well, on the day when I took them out by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. Now, have to point this out because I'm me. <laughs> it's just how I work. Um, that is a major textual variant from Jeremiah 31, at least in the Hebrew, Sept Hebrew Masoretic text. You go back and you look at your English translation of Jeremiah 31. Instead of saying, and I did not care for them, says the Lord, it says, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So go back and look at Jeremiah 31. They say, though I was a husband. Here, it's, I did not care for them. Now, is that the writer of Hebrews changing something? No. There is a variant, both in the Hebrew, that is reflected in the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is being what is being quoted here. And it's actually the difference of one letter. Uh, though I was a husband to them would be Baal. You've heard the Baals, that's Baal, which means lords. It was also used for husband. And so the Masoretic tradition has Baal, but Gaal would be to despise or to not care for. And the Gimel and the Bet, they're not identical to one another, but they're fairly similar in form. Uh, and so you have a textual variant there. And the writer of the Hebrews is writing to Greek-speaking Hebrews. That's why it's being written in Greek. And so he follows the version that they would possess uh, at that point in time. He doesn't really put a lot of emphasis on it as part of the... I mean, it does fit with his argument. He finds fault with them. I did not care for them. Um, but later in, he, in chapter 10, he will quote from the subject and he will make his argument based upon a variant. Just the reality. It's just what it is. All right. I don't skip over those things. For this is the covenant. Here we go. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Here's You want, want to know what the new covenant is? Here it is. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to them, least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. All right. So what is the nature of the new covenant? Because here's here's the argument. The sign of this covenant is only to be given to those described in the better new covenant with the better mediator and the better promises. Here's the promises. Here's the better promises. In the, up to this point, you had in Israel, you had people bearing the covenant sign of circumcision. Now, by the way, that was Abrahamic, continuing on into Mosaic. They're, they've got the sign. Look at all the kings of Israel, circumcised in the flesh, uncircumcised of heart. How many times does the prophet say this? Circumcise your heart. 
You've broken the covenant. You bear the covenant sign. But this isn't who you are. You're un, you're uncircumcised of heart. And so you had believing Israelites who are circumcised not just in flesh, but in heart, worshiping right next to people who are not. And so that meant that there had to be the prophetic ministry. Know the Lord. Let me teach you about who the Lord is. Because you don't know. So the covenant sign is given broadly, but it doesn't necessarily have a direct connection. When you come to the new covenant, I will put my laws into their minds. How does that happen? That's called regeneration. That's called being made a new creature in Christ. When you have, when you love the law of God, and when you have that desire to follow him and to do what is pleasing to him, I'll put my laws into their minds. And I will write them on their hearts. That's the innermost. This is, this is a covenant that brings about true transformation. Not by happenstance, not as the minority. This is, the, this is what makes it better. This is why it has a mediator who happens to be the Son of God who created all things. I'll put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. The prophetic phraseology over and over again was you claim to be my people, but you're not my people. Why? Because you're far away from me in heart. That will not be the case here. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. You're not going to have, you know, the priest class having to go, well, this is how you know the Lord, and that's how you know the Lord. And people are oh, you're saying there's no teaching in the new covenant. I didn't say that. I said that they will know who the Lord is. The relationship has already been established. I will be their God. They will be my people. There will not be this need to be, because of this mixed company, to be saying, know the Lord. They all know me from the least to the greatest of them. And how can that be? For I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. There it is. The new covenant is salvific. It is soteriological. If you're in the new covenant, God has been merciful to your iniquities. He will remember them no more. That's Romans 4. That's justification by faith. That's sola gratia. That's sola fide. Right there in front of us. Big old bright red flag. This is what we're talking about. So when he said a new covenant he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear, goes on from there into chapter 9 and continues that argument. He has obtained eternal salvation. Goes into chapter 10. One sacrifice perfects for all time those that are made. One will, one testament. This is the argument of Hebrews. There's nothing to go back to. So if baptism is to be given as the sign of the new covenant, these are the people to whom it's to be given. They know the Lord. His law is written upon their heart. They're regenerate. God has been merciful to their iniquities. I'll remember them no more. So how do my Presbyterian brothers deal with this? Well, you can go look at the books. I can give you, give you references. Um, one of the ways is to say, yes, Someday, that's what the new covenant will be like, but not yet. 
Think about that just for a moment. I, I mean, they're brothers. But this is one place where, man, tradition can really get in the way. And dangerously so. New Covenant has not actually been fully established yet from their perspective. That would be the most effective argument against Hebrews I've ever thought of. Just It would take just one Jewish controversialist to come up with that one in the days in which this was written to the people to whom it was written. And that's how you get around the whole thing. Because that's not how the writer is using the New Covenant. There's nothing to go back to because this is what we've got. It's here. Not, you know what? I mean, think about it. Think about what that reduces the apologetic impact of Hebrews to. Don't go back to the ways of Judaism because a few thousand years from now, this could be a whole lot better than it is now. Wow, there's, there's an apologetic for you. See how important it is to not argue these things outside of the context of the scriptures that actually give us the light to be able to see? So, here's the Reformed Baptist argument. Baptism, New Covenant, sure, we can make all the arguments, and I've I'll link, I think, I think there's a playlist on YouTube. I'll try to remember. We're done here. Link to it. Thir I think it was 13 sermons that I did within the past few two years on baptism at Apologia. And you can make the argument, and I address all the stuff in there, but you can, you know, we work, we, we, we work through every reference to baptism. And we saw what the apostolic practice was. But knowing the arguments, we knew that that's not enough. Because they argue, yep, if that's all you had. But you see, we have the Old Covenant too. And so we are going to interpret the New Covenant in light of the Old Covenant. And we're going to say, well, it's going to continue on through. And what you do when you do that is once you run into something like this, you've got to find a way around it because it's a roadblock. So, well, it, it really, you know, someday the new covenant, that, that'll, be, that'll become true someday, destroys the apologetic argument of Hebrews. You can't go there. So, here's a description of those who are to be baptized. If it's the sign of the new covenant, there's a new covenant. That's what the new covenant person looks like. So you give the sign not in anticipation or hope that someday that might happen. Because that's, that's what you're doing. That, that is the fundamental difference, is you're saying, I hope this happens someday, or what really ends up happening, let's be honest, this is something not talked about very often. How many people go Presbyterian Credo Baptist and then go all the way into full Pado Baptism? Baptismal regeneration, infant salvation. And man, I have met Presbyterians that are they're they're right there. Pierre Marcel. I mean, he actually went so far as to say that a covenant child has their has the impact of original sin removed from them so they can be a, a free moral agent. And, and once you get there, you're so far removed from the New Testament that it, it's, it's hard to even know what, what just happened. Anyway, so there's the reasoning. As long as Hebrews 8 is there, there's your New Covenant believer. They're the ones that receive the sign of the New Covenant. And, and then we're consistent because the other ordinance in the New Covenant is what? The Lord's Supper. Who's that for? Those to whom God has been merciful to their iniquities and remember their sins no more. Right? That's what it's for. And our most of our Presbyterian friends don't do that. But some of them do. So you'll see the debate that I did with Doug on that subject last year on Pato Communion. But the vast majority of Presbyterians go, nope. 
They recognize, hey, New Testament said you got to discern the body, body and blood, so on and so forth. Nope, not going to do that. And that led to, you know, all sorts of divisions of church membership versus people fully partaking and you know, all the stuff that comes with that that's a bit of a mess. So um, we'll let that go. So real quickly to the uh, statements. Uh, okay, shall all know me on the heart. Here we go. Um, the argument then runs as follows. The old covenant which God made with Abraham and Israel included natural children and Israel broke the covenant. The new covenant will be different in that it is not made with natural children but spiritual children. Only those who are regenerated unto saving faith and thus it will not be broken as the old. That's part of it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's part of the betterness is that it involves the sovereign work of God in the actual salvation of those who are in the covenant because their mediator is Christ. Uh, moreover, there will be no need for every man to tell his brother to know the Lord for each and every one in this new covenant is regenerated unto saving faith. There are no unregenerate covenant members in the new covenant as there was in the old back in the days of Abraham, Moses, and David. The mixed covenants of the old Testament. Not only can I see how someone could hold this line of thinking. Well, good. I myself did hold to it for some time, albeit with a variety of modifications, clarifications, and attendant arguments. Indeed, for me, making points like the one in this post is an exercise in what Chesterton once said. I'm not going to worry about the Chesterton quote. Indeed, for some time, I considered the various biblical promises God made to his people's children in the Old Testament as promises God made to Israel and their offspring and in some general sense, similar promises were made to New Covenant members and their offspring. I could not say with confidence that they were covenant promises from God to covenant children in the New Covenant, for I was convinced the New Covenant membership necessitated regeneration. So what he's saying is, you can be in the New Covenant without being regenerated. I was not prepared to claim the active regeneration of my infant, and I hope you still aren't, so I was not ready to recognize either their new covenant membership nor the biblical promises above as being vouchsafed to them here by Christ's blood. Key, key point. The blood of Christ is why he is mediator. He's the mediator of a better covenant based upon better promises. That's what mediation is all about. I took these promises as announced to the Christian's children even promises made to such children in a special way, given their presence in a Christian home. But I did not take them as promises stuck to them, promises from God signed and sealed upon them. But that is what they are. They are not promises potentially made to your seed, or promises merely announced like a general gospel call to the world. They are promises covenantally made, indeed, promises vouchsafed to your children by the blood of Christ. They are sworn oaths of blessing made to your children in a particular way, for they are covenant children, and the promises are to them and fulfilled by faith. So, they're made by the blood of Christ. Here's, the, the, this sounds wonderful, and I'm, I'm seeing, and this is why, I, I, again, I can name the names of the people that I can just tell you, within three years they're going to be Presbyterians, minimally. Sounds great, here's the problem. If you give the sign without regeneration, and that's what pedobaptism is. It's, we're going to give the sign, the promises will be fulfilled. So it's hoped for, and what, what the rock-ribbed federal visionists were saying is, believe the promises, they're regenerated. Leads to baptismal regeneration. There's no way around it. That's the consistency. If it's promised in the blood of Christ and you give the, they're part of the covenant, well, they're going to be saved. That's all there is to it. But here's the problem. Everybody recognizes that there are all sorts of people running around this planet right now who are baptized as children. Um, when I debated Doug in 2004, every Roman Catholic kid was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. My argument then was, it's irrelevant what words you mean if the gospel is not a part of it. And I stand by that today. I stand by that today. You can use, you can 
Use all the proper forms and everything you want. If it's not a part of the gospel, it's irrelevant. Um, but there's lots of Presbyterian boys and girls running around who were baptized as infants, and they make no profession of faith today at all. They've written books, um, all sorts of things. Um, they're apostates from the Presbyterian perspective because they were made a part of the covenant by their baptism. So here's the question. Here's the question. What does Christ mediate to them? Because Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, right? And it's that the new covenant exists in his blood. So what does he mediate to the members of the new covenant? The only thing in the New Testament that Christ mediates to the members of the new covenant is eternal life, forgiveness, grace, uh, adoption, all the beautiful things that we associate with that. Most of my Presbyterian brothers will say, what does he mediate to those who leave? Wrath. Wrath. So they will argue firmly. Uh, they'll they'll argue for uh, the you know Hebrews six so on so forth. These were these were covenant men. Hebrews ten. Why do we argue about who is sanctified in Hebrews ten? Hebrews ten twenty nine. Why did John Owen say it was Jesus, but most Presbyterians say it was the person who breaks covenant? so that you can make sure to argue that person was in the New Covenant, therefore the New Covenant is breakable, and therefore Jesus mediates wrath on members of the New Covenant. Now I see absolutely no basis, since it's in his blood. Because when you think about it, what, has, what does the um, act of apostasy, what's its description in Hebrews 10? He does what? Tramples underfoot the what? The blood of the Son of God. So, that blood has that blood has not brought about the intended regeneration described in Hebrews chapter eight. So the idea that he is mediating wrath in a covenant by his blood, when his blood is intended and perfects those for whom it's made, makes no sense. It breaks the whole argument of Hebrews that there's nothing to go back to. Because here you have the completed and finished work in Christ. His mediatorship saved to the uttermost a certain people. He has obtained eternal salvation. And we're going to turn all that on its head for a view of baptism that nobody held up until John Calvin? Oh, wait a minute. Now you just skipped everything. No. Go, go listen to my debate with Greg Strawbridge. That was the argument that I made there. Sure, I made these arguments. I made the biblical argument. But then I also added to it, you need to understand something. Now, some people say, well, there, there, were, there might have been a few people, you know, maybe there's an Anabaptist over here, maybe Bollinger over there, whatever. But Calvin develops a specific doctrine that fundamentally defines modern Presbyterianism. And anybody that knows church history knows that the infant baptism... The infant baptism of the early church, which existed side by side with believers' baptism, there were a lot of views on baptism in the first 300 years. But you dig up their churches, and they didn't have teeny little fonts. You could just move around easily like that. They had a big old thing that everybody can get down into. <laughs> and especially because even in the 400s, they're doing trine baptism forward, face forward three times. The name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. You don't do that in a little teeny tiny font. <laughs> smash, smash. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Uh, so, yeah, with the baby, yeah. So, when infant baptism, when pedo-baptism becomes the established tradition, it is for the remission of original sin. It is replacing what in the state of grace it is not what Paul taught in Romans. It is inconsistent with justification by faith. And so we don't believe these things. We're biblicists. If you're a Protestant, you're a biblicist. Congratulations. You try to run from the phrase, but you can't um, do it. So it was a theological novum 
when Calvin came up with this perspective to try to hold all this stuff together, God bless him, but he was still a sacralist. And so he, he couldn't get rid of the princes and he couldn't get rid of the, the violations of sphere sovereignty that were inherent in the system of his day. He laid the foundation for it, but couldn't do it in his own day. And so the baptism of Presbyterianism today is not the baptism of the ancient church. And I'm, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> okay? That, it shouldn't be. We believe in the gospel. That's why we can have unity together. We, have, we debate about this one, but we can still proclaim, as long as you're proclaiming, proclaiming sola fide and sola gratia, we're good. But it's not the same baptism. This was a theological novum. You need to own that and come up with an explanation for it. So, um, so anyways, uh, oh goodness, nine minutes. Did you go and but what about the Jeremiah 31 objection above? I believe the objection I detailed above simply straps too much on the back of Jeremiah. He is a strong prophet, but if we load the state objection on his shoulders, then we weigh him down with more of an argument than he can bear. Really, we must take it easier on him. The objection claims that Jeremiah 31 proves that each and every New Covenant member is regenerate at this very moment when Jeremiah's point is that the New Covenant will be better than the old. Particularly, the New Covenant will be better in that it will not be broken as the old was. It consists of God's law being written in the heart of his covenant people and it will be far more efficacious and potent in the lives of the covenant people. Here's the problem. I'm not talking about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was prophesying it. I'm talking about its application in Hebrews 8. And it's central to the apologetic argument of Hebrews. And if you do this, you're destroying the apologetic argument of Hebrews. That's the point. Broken. Regarding the new covenant not being broken, Jeremiah's point is not that an individual covenant member cannot break covenant with God in the new covenant. Rather, his point is that the new covenant itself will not be broken. The old... Now, again, put this... I, I don't know why he tries to throw this back into Jeremiah. We're talking about Hebrews 8. We're talking about a specific application. Better covenant, better mediator, better promises. Here's what it looks like, and this is why, therefore, the covenant sign needs to be given to these particular individuals. The old covenant as a whole was broken such that it came to an end. Think of the administration of the new covenant like a presidential administration, say the Washington or Jefferson administration. Jeremiah is not saying that a card-carrying member of the Jefferson administration cannot resign his membership and leave it. He is saying that administration itself is never going to fade away like the old one did. That's the end of the Hebrews argument. You just destroyed the Hebrews argument. That's not what Hebrews is saying. You follow the argument from 7 into 8 into 9 into 10. And if you want to have anything coherent left in 10, when it says, by this one will, we have been perfected forever, you can't be playing these games and saying, well, it's sort of like an administration. No, it's not. The point of Hebrews 8 is it's better because they will all know me because I have been merciful to their sins. Not to sins of some nebulous group, but to specific people called the elect. On the heart. Concerning God's law written... You, you better... You need to give me... Okay, thank you. Concerning, I'm, good, I'm trying to go fast. Concerning God's law written on the heart in the New Covenant, Jeremiah speaks to the degree of the Spirit's power and efficaciousness upon the New Covenant people. He does not imply that the saints under the old administration of the covenant of grace were saved without the work of the Spirit upon the heart. That's true. No question about that. We're not saying the Holy Spirit was not present. But what he, what we are saying, and he, now he goes to Calvin here, and of course Calvin was trying to find a way around all this stuff. We're not saying the, the Spirit was not present under the old. We are saying is that there were lots of people who bore the covenant signs under the old who did not have the Spirit in their life. They were not regenerate. That's why the prophets are saying, circumcise your heart. You don't have that in the New Covenant. You don't have that in the New Covenant. Because that's how you get into the New Covenant. Is through regeneration. Um, did, did it, he, again, more quotes from Calvin. In other words, whether you believe there is one covenant of grace and substance, which has undergone a significant renovation in form and structure with the coming of Christ, 
or you believe there has been two separate covenants, the old housing, the natural family, and the new merely individuals who are marked by active regeneration makes a big difference. That's true. But which one fits in the argument of Hebrews? Which one says there's nothing to go back to? Which one explains why the mediator of the new covenant is able to save perfectly those that are in the new covenant? Which you did not have under the old. That's the question. Shall all know me? The greater efficaciousness and potency of the new covenant is seen in Jeremiah's language. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Jeremiah here, Jeremiah here speaks hyperbolically. His point is not that the substance of the new covenant is different, such that each and every new covenant member is regenerate, opposed to the old when that was not the case. Rather, Jeremiah amplifies the point the new covenant manifests God and his truth far more broadly than the old. That is the difference. There's the division. I say, I call bunkum on that one. That is not what he is saying. There's the, there's the issue. If you go there, if you go there, you have destroyed the apologetic. You have destroyed the apologetic of Hebrews. And I don't know how you can't see it. I really, really don't. His point is that the substance of the new covenant is different such that each and every new covenant member is regenerate. Opposed to the old when that was not the... That, that is the point. Tell me how your position fits 7, 8, 9, 10. Tell me how it fits. Because it doesn't. It doesn't. This... New Covenant, with the better mediator, he writes his law upon, the, that's regeneration. That's what makes the New Covenant what it is, and that's why you give the covenant sign to those who are regenerate. I don't need to go with the rest of it, because that's, there's, there's the dividing line, right there. There's the dividing line. And it's how you're going to understand. And I, and I hope you see the danger that I see I am so thankful that so many of my brothers, and look, in many, many ways, I am closer to my Presbyterian brothers than I am to many Baptists that I know. By a long shot. By a long shot. I get it. But here's the issue, and I'm sorry, I have not heard meaningful responses. I've heard all sorts of complicated discussions about someday the new covenant will come into fruition and, and all the rest of this kind of stuff. But I have not heard someone get into the text, follow the argument, say, here's what the apostle's arguing, and here's how it makes application. I've not heard it. And that's why baptism needs to be given to those who are described in Hebrews chapter 8. That's the nature of the new covenant. And that's the nature of baptism. And you can, you can decide, I'm going to... I'm going to do this because of the authority of this person, that person. This person did it, so they, they know more than me, so on and so forth. Fine. I am reformed because the Bible requires me to be. The same exegesis I use to prove the deity of Christ, to prove the resurrection, is what proves predestination, election, the ecclesiology of reformed theology, which is not what a lot of people think it is, um, and why I hold the view of baptism that I do. There you go. So, um, that, that right there under shall all know me, I'll link to this. There it is. Because the, the, uh, second full, third full sentence. No, one, two, th fourth full sentence. His point is, and Jared says, is not that the substance of the new covenant is different, such that each and every new covenant member is regenerate, opposed to the old when that was not the case. Jared, that's dangerous. Because what you're saying is, the new covenant opens up, even this new covenant opens up the door for true members who are not regenerate. And yet it's made in the blood of Christ. I don't see how that's consistent with what we believe about predestination, election, particular redemption, 
any of those things. I don't see how making Jesus the mediator of covenant where he has to mediate wrath is consistent with any of those things. But most importantly, it fundamentally cripples the argument of Hebrews. So there you go. All right. Didn't expect to spend quite that much time on it. But once you get into Hebrew, it's hard to work through Hebrews very fast, okay? Um, it's not a book that allows surface level stuff at all. Uh, it's a little bit deeper than that. So um, here on Reformation Day, hey, don't blame me. Don't blame me. Blame Jared Longshore. He's the one that posted it on Reformation Day. This was his his Luther moment. And we just knocked the nail back out from the other side of the door. <laughs> uh, blame Calvin? Eh, not, not, uh, Calvin had nothing to do with this uh, whatsoever. Nothing at all. Okay, so like I said, right now the plan is, right now the plan is on Thursday uh, to do Radio Free Geneva and um, to try to uh, untangle the, the amazingly tangled mess that was produced in response to my criticism of John 6, the presentation made by John, on John 6. And it may take a while to do that uh, because it is truly convoluted. And unfortunately, the individual that I'll be reviewing, um, he used the Blue Letter Bible and Olive Tree Bible software. I use Olive Tree all the time on my uh, phones and iP iPad. Great stuff. But he makes a number of statements based upon the original languages saying, this 100% proves Calvinism is wrong. There's only one problem. He doesn't read Greek. It's self-evident he doesn't read Greek at all. And he, this would be a good illustration of the danger of using secondary biblical sources. I, Accordance, Logos, Olive Tree, Blue Letter Bible, whatever. They're wonderful to have. I'm not saying anything against them. But just because you can click on a word and it parses it for you does not mean you understand what that word is saying. And unfortunately, I'm going to be able to give you example after example where this man would fail my first year Greek class or anybody else's first year Greek class. Because he doesn't read the language. He doesn't understand what a participle is. Over and over again, he, he, he would say, this is a present active indicative tense. <laughs> no, that's tense mode and voice. <laughs> those, are, those are three different things. And he doesn't know how to recognize a participle. Doesn't realize that you've got substantival participles and then non-substantival and they're going to interact with finite verbs differently. And there's, there's a reason why it takes time to learn Greek. And just using Bible programs, and you know what's really sad about this? When I taught for Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary years and years ago, when I taught Greek, I only I had 15 weeks, 13 functional weeks, to go all the way through mounts. And I struggled with that because I don't want to teach people to hate Greek. I want to teach people to love Greek. When they switch to you being able to fulfill your language requirement in Greek, in a Jan term class, I pretty much gave up because Jan term is two weeks long. You cannot learn a language in that period of time at all. All they were doing was starting to use these programs and that is not learning the languages. It isn't. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Anyway, anyhow, any so, anyhow. So thank you very much for listening to the program today. Hope it was useful to you. We covered the waterfront today. That's for sure. Lord willing, we'll see you on Thursday. God bless.